Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Singfield Cup 2022. This tournament is held every single year uh, at this point since about 2013 or 2014 in St. Louis. And it is a classical event, 10 players. They all play each other one time, so nine rounds. And all of the best players in the world participate. Magnus Carlsen, Fabiano Caruana, Yan Nipomishi, Ali Reza Firuja, and so on and so on. Uh, Ding Liren obviously unable to participate most likely due to the travel restrictions that he is facing in China. But nonetheless, an extremely strong event. And today in round number one, I will be taking you through all the games. And I will be taking you through all the games in every round. Uh, we can go at a slightly slower pace than normal in these crazy recaps because there's five games per round. We know that. And in this round, Magnus uh, did an incredible thing and played like, uh, like a perfect game. I mean, he wins many games in his life, but he played a perfect game. And we got to check that out. But first... The appetizer games of the round. Ali Reza Firuja with the white pieces kicks things off against Fabiano Caruana with an English. Can we just address the fact that Fabiano Caruana is not a 27.58? Like, that's just a weird rating. This dude was 28.30 when he played for the World Championship. That's just weird. So, C4, C5. Fabi doesn't go for E5. He doesn't play for anything. He doesn't play for Knight F6. He's just symmetrical. Like, completely symmetrical. Like, whatever you could do, I could do. And now E3. Now... Here, generally speaking, when black plays like this, uh, many, many, many of the top guys are playing e6 and then trying to play for a very quick d5. And so you can copy all the way to this position. I mean, this position is also very, very equal for black. But Fabiano plays the move e5, which is very rare uh, at the highest level. I mean, it's, it's not a bad move, but it is extremely rare. And there are many lines like d4 here for white is considered the critical move. And there's some wild theory like e4, white can put the knight on e5, black can't really take it because the knight has to go back. So uh, black has to deal with this knight in the center somehow. And just a lot of like really interesting lines. Even like this, for example, it can be some interesting lines here. Uh, now, Ali Reza here plays a move that, according to my database, out of several thousands of games has happened like twice. Which just makes me think that I, I don't know, maybe he was caught off guard by this sideline and he just decided to... He plays the move queen b3, which maybe it's his prep. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I never thought that anything besides d4 or maybe bishop e2 here was, was the best for white. Or like b3, for instance, trying to get the bishop. But queen b3, so what does that do that stops d5, right? That stops the move d5 by black. Uh, but okay, Fabiano just plays d6 and he's going to finish his development. All right, and that's what both guys do. But Ali Reza is a move away from castling, so Fabiano wants to stop that from happening. To prevent your opponent from castling, you got to create some threats. For instance, Bishop f5 here is a threat. Uh, you may not want to get booted, but inducing this pawn move is very nice. Anytime you induce a pawn move, uh, you may seduce a square. Induce and seduce, you know what they say. Do they not say that? Did I just make that up? All right, well, sorry, but you've seduced the d4 square. Um... Fabiano does something similar, I mean, in terms of, like, stopping away from castling, he plays knight b4, and Ferruja has to go back, which, look, I'm a just, like, I'm not a rocket scientist, but going queen b3, and then five moves later having to go queen d1, it just doesn't strike me as particularly venomous, and Fabiano uses this moment once again for white uh, not being able to castle, and he, he blows open the center of the board, right? So, if white takes this pawn, uh, black is gonna take like this. If white takes this pawn, uh, it gets from bad to worse, because after this, this, there's this really nice move, bishop f6. You move the knight, you get hit with this, and all of this is a problem. If takes, then takes uh, on e5. And, and, and basically, the reason Fabiano is able to, to play a move like d5 is his pieces are a little bit more equipped right now. White's king is still stuck in the center, and Ferruccia has lost valuable time in the opening. And that, that, that is why he has to now do things like bail out, sacrifice his right to castle, and trade some pieces. And for a kind of a half a brief moment here, uh, Fabiano is a pawn down. Actually, if you, if you, if you count the pawns, white has seven uh, and black has six. However, he has moves like knight g4, which simultaneously create, you know, two targets. Then he plays this. And here, if white plays f3, then he's just going to be hunted for the rest of the game. And the second he creates this weakness, he's going to be hunted. And the second he plays this, we have rook d8, right? And as you see, the eval bar is in minus three. It's because black will shove the knight in and just win. 
So Fabi worked out a way to sacrifice a pawn for an overwhelming amount of what we call compensation. Compensating in life, you know, for certain things and then trying to behave a certain way is bad, usually. But in chess, compensating is very good. I mean, it's good to show off your compensation. Uh, and, uh, well, you know, that's uh, this is the position that we have. You know, we have a nice position here for, uh, for Fabiano, who just basically spent the remainder of this game uh, bullying uh, the white pieces. Like, as you can see, he is, his pieces are very active. But at the end of the day, one guy has an extra pawn. And, and that guy decided uh, that he was going to just trade all the pieces and make a draw. Now, that guy could have not done that. That guy could have played. One thing I'm actually super perplexed about is why Ali Reza in this position, instead of trading everything, didn't go take, take, b3 and just play the knight versus bishop endgame. Like, I truly, in my heart of hearts, believe the fact that Magnus would have done that. He would, like, look at the knight. I mean, no one touches the knight. Maybe you don't win this with white, but at least you play. Yeah, Ali Reza just said I had enough. And this just becomes a draw, right? It's a king and pawn endgame. Uh, and yeah, what I don't know why, why Stockfish is showing what it's showing. There are ways to lose this, but not at the highest level. And they just repeat moves. Which is why I said, you know, appetizer game. All right. Uh, the next one that I have for you is the game between uh, Linier Dominguez Perez and Maxime Vachier-Legrav. This was an interesting game. It began with a Nidorf, which actually they both play, uh, but MVL, of course, probably being the world's most consistent practitioner of the Nidorf. Now we have a main line, so Nidorf, English attack, and here, rather than developing either of these two pieces or playing the move B5, uh, MVL plays the move H5, which is a modern, very modern idea, and obviously is designed to prevent this, and also just kind of encroach on the white position. And believe it or not, as completely idiotic as that move looks, it's completely reasonable and it's one of the best moves. Now. Uh, Lanier plays knight d5, which is one of the lines. Uh, we have, for example, black, black doesn't have to take, but black takes. Uh, g6, this is all main line. This has happened many times. Uh, and as you can see here, black wins a pawn. But white now sort of, it's like unplugging, you know, like a drain, right? Like all the water starts pouring out. So all of white's pressure be becomes very, very strong here. And in this position, there are many moves. There is g3 covering all sorts of stuff and looking to get the bishop out. Uh, there is bishop c4, there is c4, there is, there's probably more moves. Um, Lanier plays a3, which has been played three times. And once by him. Once by him in May 2022 against Bogdan Daniel Deak in the Superbet Chess Classic in Bucharest, Romania. No, I did not remember that. What do you think? What do you, you think I'm smart? Guys, I'm a YouTuber. All right, if I had a good memory, if I was smart, I would have been a mathematician. All right, would have been an actuary. All right, I would have done accounting. I'm a YouTuber. Jeez Louise, apples and peas. Anyway, um, I looked it up in the database and he went on to win that game. And in that game, the moves queen c7 happened and this was the game. But in that game, they act played rook d8 and it was a very imbalanced game. He, he went on to lose the game. He, he didn't lose the game because of this position, but it was very imbalanced. MVL plays long castles, which according to my engine is the best move. So he's improved on that game. But Lanier certainly has done the homework as well, right? So he plays queen f2 uh, and immediately is worse, <laughs> um, which is kind of funny because how does that happen? Like, how do you play a game move for move exactly what you did and your opponent plays the improvement over your game and you don't play? I mean, maybe their engines are stronger than mine. My Stockfish really did not like this move. It liked this. It liked knight a5. Uh, what else did it like? It liked queen a5. It liked f4. It liked a bunch of moves. And uh, after just, like, two moves, uh, it, it, it was actually quite fond uh, of Black's position. But it's a night off, right? At the end of the day, uh, it's very imbalanced. MVL is a pawn up. White has a lot of activity. Uh, White is looking to create problems all over the board. The knight is hanging. It, it wasn't quite hanging just a moment ago. Um, but uh, I, I could be completely mistaken. Anyway, bishop a5, right? Lanier is, is using his counterplay to poke holes at the Black position. Look at his bishop. Dancing around, MVL tries to fight back on the queen side. He trades off uh, his weak d6 pawn. And visually, white's position looks much better, but black maintains a pawn up advantage. Now, this pawn is threatened, so do you defend it and allow this? I don't know. And MVL, like every very, very strong player, knows when he's had enough, when his position has had enough. And he offers not just an exchange, but he also gives up a pawn. And he does that in order to ensure counterplay and stability. He transfers his knight to the center. If you are wondering why f7 was not taken 
like this, that is because this move would have been decisive, right? It would have been fatal. Black assumed the danger many moves ago when castling queenside uh, that they were going to be under fire uh, and potentially uh, in some trouble. And so rather than getting involved in all that, MVL plays knight d4. Uh, the white rook on b3 is hanging, but Lanier wins a couple of pawns. So white has six pawns, a very, very safe king, and the bishop is going to go to e4 and just be a god. That bishop is going to see the whole board. Just the whole board. It has a penthouse apartment. All right, beautiful view. Noise-canceling windows. And uh, depending on where it, you know, lives in New York, it's going to cost, you know, anywhere between 10 and $20 million. Terrific. Um, Rook d4. All right. New York City, baby. A place where you can buy a closet for seven figures. Queen e2, Rook d8, and there it is. Now, Maxime's not just going to sit here and be worse. Uh, White is going to improve the position and just win the pawn race at the end of the day. So MBL starts fighting. It's like, nah, now nah, let's go for this endgame. Rooks versus Rook and Bishop. Uh, Black has enough pawns here where the fact that the Bishop is a god doesn't matter. Uh, the Bishop being a god would matter significantly more if, for example, White could get a Queen to a6 and use the Bishop, right? But once we get to an endgame, in fact, a Rook versus Bishop endgame, uh, I am now going to click the forward arrow for about 30 more moves. And uh, yeah, nobody can win this. I mean, the Bishop is good, but w Black is never going to deal with too many pass pawns, and uh, the pawns fall off the board very quickly, and uh, this is just a fortress. Nobody can win this, and uh, yeah, they played some more moves. Out of respect, I'm gonna, you know, squeeze my little thing here, a little stress reliever, um, forearm, for you know, wrist trainer. Oh, we squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. They could have ended the game after 69 moves, that would have been nice, but they decide to end with king versus king, which is very majestic. An interesting game for sure. MVL shows a nice opening improvement. Everybody goes home happy. Um, the next game that I have for you is the game between Shekhri Armamidyarov and Wesley So. An interesting battle in the semi Uh, it, this is, you know, typical top-level chess. This position has been seen all the way up until, uh, this moment right here. 15 moves by White. In the game between, uh, Pragnananda and Dingli Ren. Online. In the online rapid. Uh, not exactly this position, I think up until around here. And then this position was seen in the game between Bruzon Batista, uh, Cuban turned American grandmaster, uh, and uh, Guillermo Vasquez. And uh, yeah, uh, in that game, Guillermo went here, here, and just got aggressive really quickly and went on to lose the game. In this game, Wesley plays a move that if, if Wesley made this up, he's a genius. And if Wesley prepared this, he's a, a genius anyway. In this entire position, with black having six pawns, two knights, two bishops, queen, two rooks, he plays king f8. What? Well, you, you want to know something crazy? The top engine line after king f8 is bishop f1, okay? And at some point, black plays king g8. Like, black literally just repeats moves. Not right now, because this is under fire. So black will play like g5, and then even king g8. Like, I'm, I'm not joking. King g8 is one of the moves. Bishop b4, rook c1, king g8. The Stockfish is such a scumbag. It's literally laughing at the white position. It's like, you have nothing. You, what are you doing, stupid? Just like, it, it's stupid. So, Mamidyarov plays bishop b5 and makes something happen and tries to trade some pieces, but Wesley you know, kicks him out, activates his pieces, and now we're going to begin the trades. All right, the bishop has been traded. Couple of moves later, the rooks are coming off the board. Queen e7, Mamidyarov being aggressive. And the game definitely gets sharp. Definitely gets sharp. All right, but problem is that as close as Shakriar is to tasting victory and checkmating his opponent, this knight is just not going anywhere. And white is never going to have time for knight d2 because the queen is going to get kicked out. Or trapped. It's very lucky it's not trapped. Uh, but here's bishop e5. Uh, queens come off. And we do definitely have kind of an interesting endgame. Very, very tense. Uh, the players play an unbelievably solid game. And uh, Wesley ends up down upon in a knight versus bishop endgame, but with the rooks on, this is just a draw. I know that sounds nuts. You're like, what? How is that possible? Well, uh, black is just super active. Black's army does not allow the white army to move forward whatsoever. Black is very passive. Uh, black is very active. White is very passive. Like, look how active black is. It's very tough to move here with white. And um, he ends up having to lose a pawn. Uh, he tries to create a little bit of counterplay with his own pawn. 
But uh, that's all for naught. And there we go. This is just a draw. And they draw after 65 moves. Not a whole lot happened in this game. I, I have to say, I think of all the games, it was kind of the most relaxed. I mean, the Ferruja game was a bit relaxed. Now, the last two games of today's recap were very exciting. Very exciting. Uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully you're still watching and just skip ahead. Uh, so, Hans Niemann. Yes, you saw that correctly. Hans Niemann replaced Richard Report, who couldn't travel due to COVID, which I didn't even realize that was still a thing. Like, COVID, yes. Massive travel restrictions and visa problems because of COVID? I did not realize that was still a thing. I really didn't. I'm not trying to, like, I, I just thought that, like, especially living in Europe, I thought he would be all right. Anyway, Levon plays the Berlin, and in this position, Hans plays a move that almost never gets played. I mean, the moves here are knight e5 with various threats and bishop f1. a4 is rare, and the idea of a4 is knight b5, a b5, removing the knight from the defense of this. Now, there is a line here for black where... White just doesn't take this. White goes d4. And I have a weird feeling Levon didn't remember that line. But after the move a6, uh, there are only like three games ever played. Uh, the line is bishop e7. But Levon does this and gives Hans a really nice initiative from the opening. Like, see, Levon is just sort of, he's playing fast. He's like pushing Hans back. But Hans gets a nice bind on the queen side. And then Hans plays a couple more moves, declines repetition. And look at Hans's position like on move 20. Look at this position. Look at this. You tell, you're telling me that Black is having a good time here? No, he's not. Black can't move a piece. Now, the only thing that Black has going for him is the fact that this position is totally symmetrical. So even though Stockfish is saying plus one, everything is the same. All seven pawns are standing on the exact same, like, gonna set up. There's no E pawns. How is White gonna win? Yes, Queen E1 is necessary. Okay, but, but look at Black's defenses. Queen h4, all right, black defense. Queen h6, black offers a trade. All right, you trade a pair of rooks. You trade a second pair of rooks. You bring your king so black's queen can't get in. You play everything right, everything right. Bishop f1 back, okay, get the knight in. Yep, here comes a knight trade. You're gonna trade knights? No, okay, there, knight, all right, bring the queen back. Black still staying solid, threatening a repetition. All right, no, we still dancing. How are we gonna get in here? What are we gonna do? Oh, no. Now Levon is gonna trap the queen. Oh, Levon traps the queen. It's gonna be really difficult for White's queen to escape now. I mean, he can just offer him a, a queen trade. He fights back. Look at this f5. And suddenly, Han's gotta be a little bit careful. Look at Han's king. And uh, he defends and, well, they end up repeating moves. So, what did Han's do wrong? Yeah, I have no idea. Sometimes chess is hard. Right around here, Stockfish, instead of queen h4, wanted Hans to do this and try to improve his pawns and his king up together. But if you play g4, there's f5 coming all the time. So you, I mean, you, you have this weird situation where somehow both sides can push the pawns. Like, it's very strange. But yeah, I mean, I, it was a weird game for sure because Stockfish was just screaming that white is better here. But it's kind of hard to prove. I mean, Hans came up with a kind of came to the board well prepared, nice opening idea, but was unable really to get a whole lot beyond just you know the blessing of the engine. But a strong start, and hopefully he doesn't give any interviews where he says the chess speaks for itself because you know we need we need to see Hans winning. All right, we do, we don't need to see any bad uh, you know bad uh, bad bad stuff there. Um, okay, folks, look, uh, I named the thumbnail what I you know I named the video what I named it. Thumbnail is what it is, uh, and then that's because. Uh, Sometimes, you know, like Magnus is a brilliant guy and he's chasing 2900 right now. And sometimes he just does brilliant things. Now, this is, of course, an extremely interesting matchup because it's a repeat of the World Championship, right? And it's a repeat of like, you know, this position that they played many times in the World Championship where Magnus consistently chose Catalan. And I don't know if you know this about, about Jan Yaponishi. Before World Championship, he never played this. Like before COVID, Jan never played this. Jan was a G6 kind of guy, right? And so this, the surprise of the game came on move four. It was not a Catalan, it was not this, it wasn't some passive e3 thing. He took. Magnus took on d5. Why is this a surprise? Because it's a very forcing move. It forces the game in immediately into what's known as a Carlsbad structure. It does not allow Black to play a6, Queen's Gambit declined, semi-slav, knight bd7, bishop b7, 
Bishop B4, semi Tarash, Vienna. Do you see how many lines I've gone through? When you take and you do this, you are now playing out of theory. You are playing on structure. And that's what Magnus does. Just plays a couple of improving moves. Prevents knight h5, right? And you would think, okay, so he's just going to play bishop e2, and he's going to castle. He's going to play bishop e2. But first, he's going to play this interesting move. Oh, wow. So he's going to go for this position. That's very interesting. Okay. He's going to take a little bit of space, potentially weaken his king if he castles over there. It's very interesting stuff. Like, let's say black castles. Maybe you got g5 in the future. Maybe you're going to castle. Basically, what Magnus wants is 0.00, .00 in a totally unique position against Jan Nepomniši. He's basically telling Jan, look, man, uh, I respect your dynamic skills. I respect your opening preparation. Let's play a position you've never seen in your life, which requires precision, nuances, maybe no opportunity for you to become a snowball rolling downhill, right, and ga gaining more and more momentum. All right, so Jan plays queen b6. He still finds a way to be aggressive. And uh, Magnus just trades the queens. And this is a very well-known transformation, like a double b-pawn of a queen trade, but opening the rook. All right, opening the rook. Various dancing ideas, b4, b5 ideas in the future, and you always have backup, right? So, here Jan can be aggressive with bishop b4, pinning the knight. He chooses to get this bishop out of harm's way, and that immediately attracts Magnus. Like, right away. And he just, he doesn't even think twice. Now, Jan could have played bishop b4. I guess Jan didn't see the purpose. Because just this, and you're still going to take. What the machine wants to do here with black is to play this. The computer wants white to take, to take with the pawn. And then, let's say the knight moves somewhere, then to go to d5. This is what the engine wants. It wants to freeze all of white's pawn play. Stockfish doesn't think that white will win the game so long as white cannot really move the pawns, okay? Um, but notice how in the game... When knight h4 happens and he does this, white can move a ton of pawns. This, 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 and this. The whole cluster can move up together. What is absolutely fascinating about this, if you and I look at this from an elementary level, and I, you know sometimes I like to get on the same page as you, and, I'm, and I try to say things and you know make like jokes. When I saw this, I went, oh, this is rock solid because of g5, knight h5. It's an interesting idea by Jan. Magnus was like, I thought this was horrible. Not verbatim, but Magnus literally has a sublime understanding of the game. He was like, I thought what Jan did here was really bad because these pawns could be a target in the endgame. I was like, for whomst? For how? What do you mean target? For what? All right, Magnus, show me. Like I like to say, when Magnus moves, you don't ask questions. You watch. You spectate. F3, king F2. Slow improvement. Bring the bishop out of danger. Slowly moving up the board. A6. Get my king out of the way. Just playing a move for now. Slide my bishop back to f2. Because I want to support my center. And maybe I want to play e4 in the future. I like where my bishop is. Even if it's a little bit passive, it supports all my important pawns. Bishop d6 back. Slowly improving. Slowly improving. Right? Black is still equal. Now I'm going to bring my bishop back over here. I got some business maybe. Some dark squares on the queen side that I'd like to tickle a little bit. And Jan can continue to, you know... Slowly await the arrival of the white pieces, maybe b4, maybe knight c5, Jan. Feeling that pressure coming, you know, feeling the, feeling the Magnus, feeling the mag, plays c5. That is a very direct confrontation. When you play concrete solutions in positions that don't necessarily require them, you could be shooting yourself in the foot. I mean, you really need to be correct. So what does Magnus do? He makes this trade. Just a ship d2. And the pro here's the problem. The ball is just constantly back in Jan's court. While it seems as though Magnus is making slow progress, he brings this. Magnus, b4, pushes the bishop back. Wait a minute, why is it plus one? Well, it's plus one because apparently here, this was a little bit of an absent-minded move, and it took the eye off the king side. Jan brought his king, you know, he wanted to blame me, maybe do this. But here, black had to just sit. Just sit. If check, the black king can go to d7 and be safe. If white tries to play b4, b5, there is an incredible tactical solution here. Knight e4, which is wicked. Which is very much a Jan Nepomniši kind of idea. If take, take, right? The bishops get butchered. So if you don't find that and you want to go knight d7, that's also maybe okay. But then white goes here, right? 
So Black has some problems. And Jan tries to just sort of, you know, just sort of bring his rook. But now Magnus, yep, there he is. Look at that. The broken double B pawns are poking at the structure. And notice how Magnus's rooks in 27 moves have not moved. They haven't moved. He's just sitting there. He's going to expand with A and H. All right, Black plays A5. Pawn's dead. It has to die. Because if A, B5, then there's a very tragic check. King gets forced out. Rook gets forced out. And this king is stuck. Well, white's just going to slowly, slowly improve the position. So, Jan gives up a pawn. Okay, so Magnus's pressure has paid off. Now he brings the king back to defend this. Seems like Magnus has not even done anything, right? Remember a long time ago, I told you about the potential weakness of the pawns in the endgame? G5. Way back when, we were like, this is a fortress. But the problem is, that knight is needed for the stability of the position. And because Jan was never able to get his king to safety, this move wins the game. It just wins the game. You can play rook e5, I play this, I win this. Your knight is isolated, it's gone from the game. My piece has completely negated it from existence, which is why you have to go that way. But now I drop back with my rook. And then I bring my rook over to g4. You can take my bishop on d3, but that's just a better rook end game. King c7. Now you can't even take my rook. Hello. And now, black tries to fight back with f6, but we did this for a reason. I'm going to take. I'm going to take this pawn. And then, uh, yeah, I'm going to take those two. And it takes 43 moves in this game. B6, final dagger. Because if you take, I get this. If you go back, you just lose. You're way too passive here. Rook f6 anyway. Very nice. B6. Jan resigns. Guys, this is the... This is the... What? The third highest rated player in the world. Jan Yipormnishi is number three on earth. In classical chess. Magnus made that look like, like, did, did, did he, did he even like sweat at all? It's unbelievable what Magnus does. The, uh, the computer analysis on Leech has showed that he had zero inaccuracies, zero mistakes, and zero blunders. He had a centipon loss of 11. Stockfish 15 has a centipon loss of 8 when it plays. 8. Magnus had 11. I mean, it's just insane. Anyway... Singfield Cup round one is done. All draws. Magnus leads the event. He gained four rating points for this win. He is 2865. I will see you all for round number two. What can I say? Get out of here.